As we journey through life, we all encounter ebbs and flows, many highs and lows. We often come across stumbling blocks that leave us feeling quite disheartened or unsure about how to move back to the realm of possibility and positivity. No matter what we undergo, we all can embrace the journey, tap into the tools to push through and overcome, and find the beauty in the ashes. This is Odyssey with Yendi, Beauty in the Ashes. Brought to you in partnership with MasterCard and Sagicor. <laughs> Listen, I don't know which one of us is more excited. I think it might be me. No, it's me. No, no. Actually, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> Juliet. <laughs> By the way, does the world know your name is Juliet? Um, I think most people know me as Julie Mango. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So should we just call you Mangizi? Mangizi is perfect. Yeah? You know? <laughs> Julizzle? <laughs> just like Yendizel. Uh, you see what I did there. How are you? I'm good. A little bit hungry mm -hmm. because Carlington didn't feed me. Oh no. But I'm good. Oh dear. Yes. Who is this Carlington and what shall we do with him? I think you should not make him wear pink anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and he would say real men wear pink. <laughs> Um, let us talk about, before we get to the Julie Mango persona, let us actually meet Juliet. Who is Juliet? What makes her tick? What is she like? Hmm. Juliet is probably an introvert and somebody who likes alone time. And uh, Juliet is that serious person because Juliet is the one that was in the JDF, right? I sound like a schizo, don't it? And Juliet is the one that was in cadets in high school. And Juliet is the one that became the engineer. And Juliet is the one that, uh, hmm, the more serious one, the bossy one, the loud one, the tomboy one. I think that's the Juliet. Yeah. You know, it doesn't sound schizo to me. And I believe you. <laughs> I believe you because I find that people who often have good comedic skills are usually polar opposite in hmm. real life. Yeah, I've often found that. Um, walk me through that a bit. Walk me through cadets. Walk me through JDF. How did you end up there? Why are you no longer there? So, like, I was... So, when my parents got divorced when I was 12 years old, I moved to Manchester with mommy. And, you know, the whole mommy-daughter syndrome where, you know, you need a male pr presence in the house and whatever. And she was mm. like, you need to be in cadets. Yes, the cadets is good for you. And this was her finger. She's like, you need mm. to be in cadets. And I was like... I don't want to be you no know, uniform people and look weird when I'm going to school and dressing up in green and all sorts of something and doing all sorts of boy stuff. And she's like, do it. You're doing it. I'm like, okay, fine. Jeez. <laughs> so I was, in a, I was in cadets for like, uh, I, when I went to first form in Manchester High School, I was in cadets. And then from that day, that was in 1993, from that day till now, I'm still a cadet. I'm dormant now because I'm a cadet officer. And of course, I'm away, but I'm still a cadet. So in terms of the JDF, how did I end up there? I mean, I was working at um, Alcoa before, and I think it was coming to a point where they may be laying off people, and I decided that I'm nobody gonna lay me off. That's right. Uh, right? I'll I'm take my leave. Away. Yeah. So <laughs> I resigned and then I joined the JDF, and I was in the JDF for like three years. Worst time ever, I joined. Really? It was. No, but let's walk through that, please. Like, let's unpack that a bit. What what made it such a bad experience for you? Well, all right. So during that time, like I was in, I was 20, was I, I was 27, 28 when I joined the JDF, right? And then if you have, if you're not mentally strong or especially as a, as a woman, if you're not fully developed or if you don't love yourself, mm. when you go in the JDF, they're going to rip you apart. Yeah. And I don't mean like in training, I mean like just in the culture. So for me, I wasn't mentally healthy when I joined the JDF. I was still suicidal at that point and I still had, because my official diagnosis is borderline personality disorder. And uh, when I went in the JDF now, um, I had bosses who were very critical and saying, why am I here? Why are you here? And then the worst part of it now, as a woman, people will always spread rumors about it. It was actually mm -hmm. in the JDF, while I was in the JDF where I did my first suicide attempt. Really? Uh, yes. So it was very, very pressuring, not cut out for me at all, at all, at all, at all. Mm -mm. You, you mentioned a few things there that were very heavy. 
Um, first, that's not so heavy, but critically <laughs> important was if you don't love yourself, knowing how to love yourself. When did it dawn on you that you didn't love yourself? You know what? I feel like I only knew that like in my 30s, like when I was like 30, 31 there about, because I'm 40 now. And I always thought that loving yourself was basically buying stuff for yourself, yes. eating good food, yeah. um, you know, talking good about yourself, getting an education. That's what I thought um, loving yourself yeah. was. Going to school, getting a master's, getting a good job, buying yourself a nice car, um, buying a nice house. I thought that that's what it was. But then, you know, as I became quote unquote successful, my mental health deteriorated. It just mm. plummeted. So it's like I was living two parallels. So mm -hmm. I was being successful, but at the same time, my mental health was dropping. And if I didn't really get a hold of it, I probably would have been dead at this point, to be honest, right? Um, so I just realized, I, I used to tell people, because a lot of persons were telling me that I don't love myself. My friends were telling me that I'm not fit to be in relationships. I can't do this, I can't do that. And I'm like, you're bad man, move. Of course, mm. I can do this, I can do that. And um, when I realized that something was wrong, when I started to face my own truth, was actually in my 30s after suffering with it for like 15 years, 15 or more years. But not knowing what it was. Yeah. Or knowing people telling me what it was, but I refuse to believe it because the stigma and, you know, I am too. And then my parents, my family don't know what mental health or mental health issues are. So I didn't want to like disappoint them. So I kind of just stayed away from it and not really going to it too much. I'm almost certain you have hundreds of people who just heard you say that simple statement. Mm -hmm. And they're like that part when you say my family didn't <laughs> acknowledge mental health issues, <laughs> didn't know about mental health issues. Um, walk me through that type of familial structure and knowing and learning about your personality disorder. And what does that look like for Julie as she's trying to navigate her new awareness yeah. within this familial structure? Let me tell you. All right, so... Um, in 2011, that was my first suicide attempt, right? Um, I wrote off my car on the highway between Falmouth Police Station and Delta Company, right? And when my father found out, because of course they, they took me back to, they gave me two weeks leave to just take some time off and I was staying with my dad. And when my dad was talking to me, I said, dad, I don't know how to love myself. I don't love myself. And he's like, how do you mean you don't know how to love yourself? You know! You know, you know, you know, you know, you know. I'm like, Daddy, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many times you tell me I know. I just don't. I don't have the tools. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, what? But, but look at God. And, and look how much things you have. Look how, much, look how much things I provide for you. Look how God provide for you. And then he's like, look how God can work miracles. You talk about piece of something. Because Daddy's very dramatic, right? You talk about piece of metal something, so. And you go, so. And you say, hi, Lana. And you call your auntie a foreign, <laughs> right? Hmm? And then your, your, your auntie and friend took up and said, hi, boss, right? And God is so good. I hear you want to kill yourself, Pitney. Look how life great. This look, and I'm like, I understand, but I just... So they just, were, they just weren't able to fathom mm -hmm. the possibility of not loving yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because um, daddy is not a stranger to depression. Mm -hmm. He's one of those alpha males that are not afraid to cry. So I just couldn't understand how he couldn't relate to your exactly. experience. And mommy, she is so self-righteous. I don't mean it in a bad way, but you know, love mommy. If you're watching this, <laughs> kudos girlfriend. <laughs> but... Um, She's self-righteous in terms of like, if you talk about depression or sadness, she's like, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You come here with that. It's, it's foolishness. So mm. I couldn't necessarily talk to them. And then my sister now, she, if you notice, and, and you might be able to, my sister is the most confident person you'll ever meet. I really? guarantee you. Not even Usain Bolt. Not even Spice. Oh, that's levels. Not even. No, no, no. Okay. That's levels. Okay. You say that spice? Okay. them for me, you know. <laughs> okay. So really? She, she, yes. She, she is the most confident person you will come across. People will think she's just downright narcissistic, right? Because you, you, can't, you can't penetrate that thing that she has, right? And 
when I was cutting myself in high school and stuff, because when I, when I was going to high school, I used to cut myself, especially if I felt depressed, I would just cut, 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 cut. Even some of the scars are still there. And um, she said, I don't, I don't understand what you're doing, Julie. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> that's it. She said, I, 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 don't, I don't get it. Um, it. It makes no sense. Are you, are you stupid? Wow. Like, no. And she's like, okay, but you, you can't be doing this because mommy works hard to take care of you and I work hard. And you're my sister. You're a, you're a bodily. You're a bodily. So you, you can't. That's embarrassing. Wow. And I'm, and I'm like, so you know, and you know what it was to like, it's, that was their way of showing me love. That's my sister's way of showing me love. Even to this day, she does not understand why I doubt myself or... Like why I would feel bad about who I am. Why there's some things that she will say will really hurt me. Because she doesn't mince her words. And she just don't understand that, that part. Like no. And uh, so navigating through my family. I had to distance myself from them. For probably mm. like maybe eight months. Mm. And when I say distance. I mean don't interact. And I told mommy to. I remember when I made the announcement to mommy. Because my therapist advised that. In order for me to, to start the healing process. I had to distance myself from a big trigger. And the trigger was your family? Yeah, unfortunately. Mm. <laughs> and I told, I remember telling mommy, I said, mom, I'm not going to talk to you until August. It was January um, a couple years ago. And she's like, oh, your therapist tell you not to talk to me. <laughs> You're not a therapist. <laughs> you know, and she, she had an issue with it. Ouch. But I had to. And then when, when, I, when I was disengaged from them, I started to figure out who Juliet is. What, why does Juliet feel so much pain? What are her depression triggers? Who does she want to be? What are her strengths? What are her weaknesses? And it was only during that time where I was able to know myself. And it's only when I know myself that I can actually deal with my family, know my triggers, um, know when to steer clear of them, know if I can go to certain family gatherings because they, they really don't understand that sometimes I'm not necessarily like a, the black sheep or anything like that, but I am the only one who is open about my mental mm. health struggles because the, the others, they have mental health issues as well. It's and the open part. Yes, but they're not open about yeah. it and I see it and I, don't, yeah. I just, yeah. What do you think was the thing that made you start to cut? You know what? So when I, <laughs> you know, you know what? It was curiosity. Really? Yeah, because at age of eight, that was the first time I remember it clearly, clearly, clearly. I took a bottle stopper and I scratched myself on my thumb. And I don't know why they were, I got so much gratification out of seeing the little teeny bit of blood. Because you know when you only scratch your skin, just a little bit of blood comes out. I got some weird gratification out of it. Mommy say a demon possess me, a demon possess, but it's all right. And, um, you know, I saw it and uh, it's like that, that, that spirit of self-defamation and self-mutilation, just de destroying the self. It felt like something that I deserved or something that, that was good for me. Ooh. And so Ooh. I grew up thinking that I was less than and that I was a mistake because also... And I will get into when my parents got divorced, but so I, in my family, so it's, it's weird, right? My, my parents were good parents and also terrible parents. So like daddy was an excellent provider, right. like excellent, you know, um, you wanted for nothing. I exactly. I wanted for nothing. And mommy, she was an excellent caregiver. You know, if, I never got sick and to this day I hardly get sick because she taught me how to eat, how to feed myself, how to dress properly, um, how to carry myself, how to speak up in public. If, if she carried me out in public and somebody said, hi, Julie. And I was like, hi. She would just clap my mouth, speak up. So, <laughs> um, you know, so they were very, but then like, I remember one time saying to mommy, mommy, you know, I love you. And she run me, she said, what am I with your foolish sister? So, so when I look at those things, it's that stoic type yeah. of parenting. It's yeah. the stern. It's the yeah. mm. no. Nowadays, she's always crying on the phone. Julie, I'm sorry, mom, stop. No, but hold on though. <laughs> Here is my question: Why tell her stop? Because do you think that she's now realized the role that she's played and is taking accountability for it? Yeah, but then she don't. She uh, is. 
And what will that mean for your oh, own you know, healing? Your problem. But me heal already. Because like I, I see or her rather, and I love her. What does it mean for her own ability to forgive herself? Ah, Julie, come on now. Lord, yeah, they make you have to do it so loud. So let's talk sure. about it, girl. No, but think about it. She's literally <laughs> saying, oh my gosh, I, I see the role I've played here. But you, to go through that with her though, judge her. Uh, but you said that's her job, not yours. No, I mean, well, it is, but I wouldn't really put it like that because it's my mom and right. she loves me, you understand? And mm. family is family. Um... But I guess it would mean, but the thing is, when she does it, I don't see the progress. I don't know if she's doing it in order to heal or just in order to cry. And for me, I can't. So when she's crying, it makes me sad and I don't want to go through that. It's Because that very, will spiral for you. Yes, it got will spiral you. for me and I will just not be able to function. Got you. Mm -hmm. I got you. So ultimately, you have to protect your peace in the yes. process of the family healing and yes. taking accountability for their role yes yes i got you i got even you. though i love my mom i yeah when i talk to daddy about these things it's a little bit different though he's more cheerful and he's like like if i would tell him that you know because to be honest with you he played no part in me feeling bad bad about myself like he was i don't know he was just weird but they fought in the home right and I think that that had a lot to do with my depression. And I know that they were always telling me stories about how their childhood was hard and mommy had to go to school with one shoes and is all of them did wear the same shoes. And when she get the shoes, it did wear down. And so it was a lot of depressing mm. um, generational stories or ancestral stories, I should say. And I just, it's, I really, when I think about it, I really don't know how my depression just came out of nowhere but i know when it came on me and it started when i was eight and that's a really such a delicate and young age but mm -hmm. also it's the ability that you have that awareness around yeah. it what did it feel like at eight years old do you remember what you did you, say that you just always felt sad so it, it 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 felt like i didn't like how i looked it was so simple. There was this girl at my school. Her name is Yannick McLaren. We're still friends to this day. But she, her, her heel back. <laughs> Not the heel back. Her heel back was really... It never really, did a crack. <laughs> no, no. It was really thin and straight. And I found it to me the most beautiful thing ever. And then I went home and looked at my heel back and I said, I don't like how my heel back look. It turned this way. I want it to look like, I want it to look like Yannick on. And then I told mommy about it. I said, mom. I don't like how my heel back look. She's like, something nice. What do you don't like how your heel back look? Huh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but I immediately think of your skin. <laughs> now I know yes. who the source of your inspiration <laughs> is. So don't go to me. No. She's like, don't go to me with that foolishness. What you don't like, you like your heels. God made you. Hmm. And um, mm. of course, that did not solve that. Oh, no. And you know, like there are so many things that she would misunderstand. Like... I, was, I remember I was watching Fresh Prince of Bel-Air one time when I was little, right? And Ashley was having like a fit, a, a total tantrum. And I looked at it and I laughed. And then the next day, uh, mommy said, I don't remember what she said to me. She said something to me. And then I said to her, it's like I was trying to defend myself and trying out the little tantrum. You're like, let me try this at yeah. home. <laughs> and, <laughs> As seen on TV. And, and I tried it and, she's, and she, she always, she didn't beat me or anything. She either threw her slippers. And that's why I say my parents were good, but you know, understand? Cause she did, I didn't get much beating. When daddy beat me, that was like a joke, right? But she had this thing where she would cup her hand and, and grab my mouth if I'm being rude. So I was, I, I threw the tantrum and she did her cup hand thing. Stop it, stop it, right? Stop it. And then she said, you're watching too much Fresh Prince, you know? You're trying to be like, Ashley, you stop your foolishness. You stop it. I'm not going to let you watch that show anymore. And really and truly what I was doing is trying to express myself to her. Right. And right. it just did not work out. So I think, you know, navigating the space with my family, it, it was tough, but I just, I just had to. How does one have multiple <laughs> episodes of suicidal thoughts? How does one attempt suicide multiple times, but find 
healing and find peace. What is the thing that now makes Julie want to live and not want to leave this life? <laughs> I don't even know. A joke. Um, <laughs> but that's also okay if you don't know. That's okay. You know what? You know what? Apart, well, of course, uh, it's the grace of God. 100%, right? But, um, so, let me tell you an interesting fact. Like, after you've attempted suicide, you don't feel, you don't feel better, you know? Because what happened is that you tell yourself, you realize, okay, so you fail at life and you also fail at death. Like, what are you? Some, some dweeb. Wow. You know, and then. I never thought of that. Yeah, so you actually, when you, when you live through a suicidal episode, you actually feel worse. Wow. So that's why you try again. Most people, when they attempt it once, um, you know, they will attempt again because if they don't get healing and if they don't get therapy, mm. because you always want that way out. So I ended up feeling a lot worse, right? And then, the, so that was the car crash. The second time was overdose um, on medication, on, on sleeping pills. And the third time was drinking pine salt. <laughs> Both those what? two episodes, yes, both those two episodes landed Julie. me at UA Hospital, and they pump um liquid charcoal. That's that's why I'm really good at taking the COVID test, because when you when you are when you poisoned yourself and you go to UA, they, oh God, you look. <laughs> oh, my God. No, I'm sad. <laughs> when you when you when you poison yourself, right? And you go to UA emergency, they, they push a, a tube down your throat, through your nose, and they pump liquid charcoal. That's how they get, they get the poison out. So that's why when I do the COVID test, that's child's play for me. I just wanted to add that in there because everyone is, you got that right? Because everyone is afraid of the COVID test. You, okay, yeah. And so, um, wow. So, and, and after, after those two episodes, I ended up in Ward 21. Because when you poison yourself, they're going to come, um, come, um, admit you to Ward 21. You know, it's how casually you say it for me. I just yeah. can't get over how casual. Like That's what therapy and healing does to you, I'm no, telling you. No, but let's slow right down right there. Walk me through Ward 21. Walk me through being told you, know, you need to go into a psychiatric ward. You need psychiatric evaluation. You need medical. Like, what is that like? Do you know Dr. Daniel, I forget her last name, the, the person who actually put me in Ward 21 the first time was, she goes to TLC. She did, we didn't know each other at the time, and I always remind her. And she's like, oh my gosh, don't do that. But, so what happened is, um, when they when they put the, 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 pumped the charcoal down and they revived me and stuff and got me, because I was passed out on both occasions, right? And how I was found, that's another story. But um, she so asked how me. How were you found? So when I had the, um, the overdose of the sleeping pills, my door was open and my landlord was walking by. This was Great House Boulevard, right? Right beside the Mona Dam. My landlord was walking by, saw me on the floor, um, lift me up, put me in his car, drove me to the hospital. Wow. Yes. So um, when she revived me now, the doctor revived me, she asked me if I'm hearing voices. So I said, yes. And she's like, okay, we're going to have to admit you. But then I realized she meant if I'm hearing voices in my head, but it's actually her voice I was hearing because she asked me if I was hearing ah. voices. And so um, when I realized, no, I was going to Ward 21, I was devastated because I was still in the JDF and I was embarrassed. And I know the song is which, is T.O.K. sing about Ward 21 or there was a, a group that named Ward 21? War, there was a group, Ward 21. Yes. I mean, I said, but at this may come to, like, because the stigma, the stigma associated with me, and that's why I didn't seek help, and that's why I wasn't really, you know, willing to face it. But the stigma associated with mental health is even worse than the mental health issues itself, right? A word. So I'm saying it in my mind now, at this may really come to big, big engineer, big, big JDF strapped in, successful 28-year-old, and I look good because them time there, my belly was flat. <laughs> um... Big big engineer. I mean, said, you look still look good, girl. Thank you. You look good. Yeah, you me. smell good. Yeah, yeah, me smell clean. No, yeah, you smell, no, you smell nice. Actually, yeah, no, no, for real. No, I'm coming. Yeah, me thing. Come here, come out to the public. Plus, people know me now. So, like, if them ask me for a picture, I'm a go so. We can't have one for this. Yo, Julie, my um, twinky, 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 twinky. Can't do that. Anyways, back to the subject at hand. Arm. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. It's the arm for me, but not this arm. <laughs> Really? <laughs> um, oh my gosh. So you're saying you. like the stigma attached. Right. So I know you're going into right. War 21. So I'm going into War 20 and I'm thinking to myself, 
I can't this is gone to. And then now, that feeling alone, it just pile up on top of things. Now, the issue that I have with how um, Jamaica deals with mental health on a whole is everybody mad. Yes. Right? So it's a brush stroke. Everybody mad. So it's yeah. not like somebody is depressed, somebody is hallucinating, somebody is schizophrenic. They don't categorize it. And what happened with me, when I was in, and I'm going to use the word sentenced because it felt like a sentence. When I was sentenced to War 21, they put me in a room with someone who is hallucinating. Yeah. And I was depressed. I wasn't having hallucinations. So imagine me feeling sad about my life, right? Lying down in a bed in a, in a, in a ward that is poorly lit. It was, it was horrible. And in my, my roommate getting up in the night, you know, you're talking to herself and she gets up and she walks and she casts out demons and this and and she come and she was spitting all over the place and oh. she looked in my face and she spit on me and then she come out and she this her thing was just horrible and this is not me scorning her or anything because no, everyone no. has you know she yes. she had an issue that she needed help but putting me in a room with her made things worse, worse for, for you, me right and i was depressed. i was destroyed yeah and then in the bathroom when i went in the bathroom it's like it was so horrible i didn't even want to bathe but in, in the, the, the facilities are set up so that it makes you even more depressed. I remember the, the, you, you have to walk on, it's not, I was going to say like a country bathroom, but no, because I'm not going to this no country bathroom. Right. It was horrible. Yeah. Right? So the facilities just weren't good. And then they have a thing where you can only watch TV between 9 and 12. And then after that TV lock off and you have to go, there were no activities. So the TV lock off and you have to go in your bed and, and just lay down. So I look and so you're almost mad. Right? You have to lie down in your bed and you have to stay in your room for one hour. And then they come back out and they turn on the TV. You can and it, it was only TVJ that they might even have CVM. <laughs> <laughs> I think looking at Netflix. Could I say, well, all right then. <laughs> Nothing. She would have said this is not my channel love choice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so the, the, the War 21 is set up for you to be worse off when you live there. And it really needs to, you, it needs to be yeah. helping you to heal, to exactly. be reintegrated. So what, so, and then um, I was, the, I, I almost was sentenced to Bellevue. But what happened is that I ran out of the hospital before the doctor came back to, to care of it. <laughs> it was really? me and my boyfriend at the time because I had some issues. And then he said, okay, let's, let's carry you to the doctor. Let's carry you to UAE. And I went there and the doctor asked me, do you have suicidal ideation? And I'm like, duh, that's why I'm here. I'm thinking of how I can kill myself. Yeah. And instead of talking to me about it, she's like, okay, we're going to have to put you in Bellevue. And I'm like, no, not again. What? No, that's not going to help. I need to talk to somebody. Like, can I talk to you? And she's like, no, 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 no. When someone talks about having suicidal ideation, we have to put them in protective care. We have to protect them from themselves. And I'm like, this is not helping me. And she's like, ma'am. You're not in a position to tell me what to do. And she's like, just sit tight. Um, let me go and get some paperwork. Well, when she gets up and gone for that paperwork, I turn around and I say, Bobby, <laughs> out. Let's go. Out. And he's like, Julia, no, but because he was trying to help me in his right. own way. Because most people don't understand. Right. Even those who love you and try to help you, they have no clue. So he's like, no, Julia, maybe it will help you. Maybe. You know, I'm like, no, let's go. And I go to the hospital. Matter of fact, we ran straight out you again. Because we're like... <laughs> <laughs> we're like, what if she what if she have like security guard? And she called, hey, hey, the person that's leaving. I was like, I was really thinking. This is like the movies and I need to escape. Like, no, I would die. I was so funny. Like, I mean, afterwards, we kind of laughed. And then the funny thing is we were parked inside. So I was like, Bobby, we park inside. We have to go back. You, you run when you <laughs> in the car? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we say, all right, let's wait a little bit. Let's wait a little bit. Maybe it blow off until she just get her next patient. And then we'll wait probably like about 20 minutes on the other side of UA, um, UA Hospital Gate. Just, just chilling. And um, we went back inside for the car and that was it. So what happens that brings you to the point of, no, I actually, I do love myself. I do love who I see. I do love my life mm -hmm. and I don't want to leave this world. What brings you to that point? So therapy. Yeah. But let me tell you, the therapist that I have now is the same one that I've had 
even when my health, my mental health was plummeting, you know what changed? I wasn't in Jamaica. So my environment. Yeah, my healing hasn't even, it's, it's been very recent. I left Jamaica in 2018. And in 2018, I was still, I was still putting um, gun to my head and sending pictures to people saying I want to kill myself. I took a, a selfie with a gun inside my mouth and I sent it to um, a couple of friends and said, I don't like it here in the US. I want to kill myself. I don't like it. Like I was, I was still going through it. I won't even lie. And um, so when, 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 when my therapist know, you know, because... One of the things with mental health is that you don't think you need therapy, right? So there, there would be times when I would just not call my therapist and she would call me and I would just not answer because I think she's stupid. Like, I'm the one that's in charge of my life. Plus, I was always into, you know, self-help and motivation and, 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 and Les Brown and Miles Monroe. Plus, yeah, I'm a Christian, so I don't have mental health problems. And... There were just times when I just wouldn't talk to her, but she kept on reaching out to me and saying, you need to continue therapy. So eventually I started back the therapy with her. It was a whole different ball game when doing the therapy with the same therapist I had in Jamaica. Why? Because the environment was different. And, and I'm not told him, I said, go far no, God, you better than Jamaica. No, I know that I say, I say, I no. have to explain to yourself. <laughs> in the USA, Admitting that you have a mental health issue is almost like a badge of honor. It's almost like a puppy. Right? <laughs> right. right. Uh, Log, I'm licking mic. Sorry. Is all right. Are they online? You're okay, good. sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's, almost like, it's almost like a badge of honor, right? And if you are seeking therapy, people is like that. It's just so different. You know, them tell is rich people go to therapy. Not no go so, but it's just that. It's almost like you are seen as taking responsibility for your flaws then. Right, right. Or taking responsibility for what's happening with you instead of allowing yourself to plummet and get worse. So um, when that, when, because even my co-worker, she is on um, antidepressant medication and she talks openly about it. And then I was like, okay, well, this is not like something to be ashamed of. And because the environment was different, I was able to absorb the therapy, absorb what she was saying to me. And after a few months and after a little bit over a year, it just kind of hit me. It actually hit me when I was reading Proverbs, but it was just not reading Proverbs alone that did it. It was everything that led up to that, right? Um, it just kind of hit me that I don't want to die. It, I, to this day, I remember when it happened, I was in my couch. I was reading the book of Proverbs. And I was reading where it says, um, happy is the man. Oh, I go again. The fear, the wisdom is the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? But happiness, I don't remember the verse, but it's saying happiness is when you find wisdom, right? So I did it like a math equation. So happiness equals wisdom equals the fear of the Lord. And I'm saying, oh, to this day, I can't explain it. And then um, I just didn't want to die. But the funny thing is now, not wanting to die, that's not where it stops. You have to know how to live. Ah, that part. <laughs> that part. So yeah. when I told my therapist that now, she was like, ah, okay, this is where I come in now. Mm -hmm. And then she, she, she taught me to unlearn some things and thought processes that I learned when I was a child and when I was a teenager. And she had to dig way back and unearth some stuff and... And teach me how to think differently because that's what therapy is, you know. It's not right. saying you're gonna be okay, you're gonna know. It's the tools to reprogram yes. your you thoughts. You are reprogramming and you, yeah. your thoughts. You are it's like you're getting a it's like you're shut down and you're getting a totally new hard drive. I would think when they put it inside the computer, you work. Hard all, drive. All drive, all drive. <laughs> you're getting a totally new not hard drive. <laughs> you're getting a totally new hard drive, a totally new um system. What do you call it something that was either Mac or Microsoft? CPU? System. Uh, Operating oper system. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're, getting a you're getting a totally new operating system and that's what therapy is. Right. And so that's just it. It's not, I mean, you know, life isn't perfect and it's not about being happy and hunky-dory every day because that's fake, right? It is about finding healthy coping mechanisms for the stresses that you have in life and finding your coping mechanisms for things that will happen because things will happen. That's right. You know, and it's just the way you deal with them. And 
therapy teaches you to just live life. And living life you have been doing. Ja, ja. With living life, you have birthed Julie Mango. <laughs> Can we please talk about Julie Mango and how much it gives you life, but gives us <laughs> life, girl. We <laughs> say when we done rule, you know, <laughs> when we are watch them skit, they you know. <laughs> hey, how did Julie Mango come to be? So the the name Julie Mango actually, my dad gave me that when I was little. You see, this is why I tell you, my parents were good parents, that, you know, because yeah. it's so much fun I had with them, especially with daddy, right? Um, so there was this mango tree in the front of the yard that was a Julie mango tree. And I used to be always at that tree, picking Julie mangoes, eating them. And then daddy being the troublemaker that he is, just started to call me Julie mango, right? So the name stuck from that time. And then, so the, the whole animated way that I speak and the joke giving and the this and the that <laughs> comes from my dad and my uncle Tarbod. Because my uncle Tarbod... Not Tarbod. I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> As in Tarbod? Tarbod. That's his pet. That's his nickname. It could only be. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Tarbod. Tarbod. T-A-U-B-U-D. We, we also had a spelling for it. Where yes. that come from? <laughs> Okay, the story that I heard, right? Because I asked him how he got the name Tar, but he don't know. So I asked Grandma, which is his mom. And Grandma said, oh, because he went kill one bird. And he freeze the bird and then he talk about the bird. <laughs> me know, man. Me say, me know. <laughs> because in Jamaica, your nickname, half for doing something. We got some sort of way. So from Been that, no so from that, then, uh, she said from that, then call him Tabod. <laughs> and sometimes when him talk, quite country people, when you pronounce the word, they, a word that ends with D, it, they pronounce it T. So sometimes it's Tabot. Mm -hmm. Right. So your daddy and Tabot, so man. My, so my daddy and Uncle Tabot, Uncle Tabot always used to come over and look for daddy and they would be on the veranda chatting, laughing, chatting people and the whole animated storytelling and, and grandma is like that too. Grandpa was like that because my two grandfathers are passed. And I just get it from them, you know. You are so good at it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about um, a couple of skits. The school shoes one for me, <laughs> mash down. The science teacher, no, the RE teacher. No, 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 the maths teacher. <laughs> the shoes there, proper, proper, proper. <laughs> Let me tell you what else mash me down. Greetings from across the world. <laughs> it's Devon. Is it Devon here? <laughs> <laughs> has that been for you how much joy has that brought you not to be honest you know that's not really i wouldn't call it an outlet and i think persons don't really understand it, it's just me being me yeah you know the, the outlet part of it so comedy is a this how do i explain it though comedy is not a part of healing like if anyone is having an, a, a, a mental health issue comedy can't heal you comedy can only humor you if you're already okay Ah, so it's not wow. really an outlet for me. It's just me being me, like actually living in my truth and living in my purpose. Because I was always, I always had this personality. Right. In high school, I was always cracking people up. I didn't know what it was. Right. I was known as the class clown. I didn't mind it. I didn't care. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so this is just me being me without the burden of a mental health problem. Right. Right. Yeah. I have one question that I think everyone wants to ask myself included why is it that you have lipstick on both lips today <laughs> <laughs> because julie wears lipstick on both lips but but my first form teacher at manchester high she always used to have the shine lipstick on just one lip and she was the hottest thing and she used to wear exclamation perfume and oh my god i remember <laughs> that perfume yeah 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 yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, so every time she have on the bottom <laughs> lip lipstick alone on the video, you know, me mash right down, you know, before she even talk. <laughs> it's a thing. It was a style. It, it was, was a style. style. Yes, man. It was it's hot so girl was thing. A, me say, and that's how you know, the original <laughs> hot girl them, you know. Where do you see yourself going with the Julie Mango persona? Well, to be honest with you, um, you know that, well, I don't think you know, but I recently rejoined, rejoined, <laughs> As in I re you rejoined, yes? <laughs> nope, not even that, I don't know. <laughs> so anyhow, we recover from that. I recently, <laughs> I recently resigned from my engineering job to do content creation full time. Wow. Yeah, because it, it gives me joy. 
You see, like when I was doing engineering, it felt like it felt like I was swimming upstream. Yes. Even though I was good at it, I was I was I was working, working, working. So I didn't mean to be political there. <laughs> um, in your green dress. <laughs> 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 Not you being um, an oxymoron. <laughs> But um, it felt like I was swimming upstream, like like it just it, I had to. It just didn't feel like it was me. And for yeah. years, and I think it had to do with a part of my mental health breakdown too, because for years I just felt like I missed it, like I wasn't doing what I really wanted to do. And then with this, um, with what the, the success of the TikTok videos and everything, um, I prayed about it because you know, um, and I spoke to my therapist about it, and I was like. I think I should just resign my job and do this full time. So I did that. That was uh, that's the bravest thing I've ever done Absolutely. at 40, so giving brave. up a nine to five. And I was born a nine to fiver. My dad is a living nine to fiver. Right. And for me to do that, it took guts. And of course, my family does not know that I've resigned. They're going to know now. They're going to know now. And that's OK. <laughs> they have, I couldn't even talk to them about it because right. I couldn't fathom that. Right. And it was a, it was something that I had to just do. Just me and God. For you. Yes, for yeah. me. If I fail, well, all right, then I saw it go. But you tried. Yes. Yes. And so I, I'm okay. going to do this full time. I'm actually doing, uh, thinking of doing a comedy sketch series. And that's why I'm actually in Jamaica. I'm filming a comedy, a pilot for a comedy sketch series. And see my big old ugly managers over there. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> but yeah, um, I have a team of managers. They I are. I know someone wouldn't take that though. I have a team of managers. They are the most narcissistic people ever. A joke. Just kidding. They are wonderful. <laughs> wonderful to work with because Carlington actually stalked me on um, IG. And I was saying to him, like, I'm not into you like that. You know? Okay. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I, I'm not, you know? And he was like, You sure? I'm like, Yeah, I'm sure. And he's like, Okay. Well, you do think you want to go into film? And I was like, yes, I would love to. I want to be on Netflix. No, don't think of Netflix. Think about something else. We have a, all right, you know, give me your number. I will call you. I will call you. And I'm like, okay, cool. So then he did call me and we discussed it. He asked me where I wanted to be. I said, I want to be a full-time actress. I'm sorry. I'm still dying at the voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it would have no calling touch. That was good. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. So I said, I, I want to be an actress um, full time. It has been my dream since I was 12. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, I told my mom I wanted to be an actress. And in all her wisdom, you know what she said? And by the way, disclaimer, I'm not blaming mommy for I think she did her best based on how she was raised. It's a right. generational thing. So right. everybody is improving for the next generation. My kid, if I have any, will talk bad about me when they get big. My mother said, my nose was beautiful. It's not, you know. So, um, what did she say when you were twelve and she seven? She said, an actress? "She said, no, 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 don't do that because if you meet in an accident and your face gets messed up, you can't act the role." Wow. <laughs> yes, and I believed it, and I was wow. like, "I don't think I can do acting because if I meet in an accident and my face gets messed up, I can't do the role." Wow. And then it was just the other day. I was like, "But that's with any job." That's right. Like it was just like a couple months ago. And when I when I talked to her about it, she's like, lie, me never tell you not lie. I would have never said anything like that to you. I said, Mom, you did. She's like, Julie, why you were saying like that? Don't tell no, I didn't say I didn't say that. And um, so right, so I want to go into acting. I'm here shooting the pilot for my comedy sketch series, Ju the Julie Manga Show. And I am managed by First In Line Plus, those two garrison looking youths over there. <laughs> And um, <laughs> they, they're managing my talent and, you know, they're helping me to meander through this whole industry because it's new for me. Yeah. I've been in the in engineering industry for forever. And, you know, leave it up to me. I will just run amok if I'm by myself. <laughs> and, you know, I did. I wrote the script for the Julie Manga show and I sent it in to them and they looked at it and they ripped it apart. <laughs> oh, my gosh. A joke. But um, I sent the script to them and they liked it. They loved it. And so it's kind of an improvement or it's kind of what I post on Instagram on steroids. Ooh, and that's what the Julie Manga show. forward to Right. That. So that's what the Julie Manga show is going to be on. It's going to be exclusively on um, First In Line Plus, which is a streaming platform in Jamaica. So they never give me the Netflix. They never give me the First In Line. Let me work with it still. For now. Step in stone. Step in stone. Well, no, yeah. Step yes. in stone. <laughs> One step at a time. One step at a time. Um, what would you say 
to persons who are watching who are struggling with mental health get, issues? Get help. Nothing is wrong with you. You have a mental health issue. It's just like if somebody have diabetes, if they if have high blood pressure, if them get a cut and them a bleed, nothing no wrong with you, nothing no come after you. You're still all right. If you're having a mental health issue, go and get help. Jamaicans, Jamaica is not short of qualified psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists. It's just that they're not popular like that because people only go at GP to get, to get cold medicine and heart surgery or foot surgery or whatever. Nobody talks about the mental health stuff, right? I had a girl that was working with me in a box side office who studied what? Psychology. Wow. Because she don't, she can't get no work. You understand? So get help from me. And, and if you're doing therapy, please, you can't go to a counselor for therapy. You have to go to someone who is trained, licensed psychotherapist, psychologist to help you to, to get the therapy. Just get help. Just listen. Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with you. It's just a sickness like anything else. If 40-year-old Julie could give a message to 8-year-old mm -hmm. Juliet the day she was curious about cutting, what would she say to her? Wow, I've never thought of that. Hmm. To eight-year-old Julie... Don't do it. I think that's what I would say. I don't know if my eight-year-old self would listen, but don't do it. I don't, so where I am at now, I am still learning to love myself. I'm not going to be sitting here and pretend like, okay, everything is hunky-dory. Like I just started getting healing two to three years ago and I'm unpacking over 35 years of doing something. Yeah. So I am at a point now where I am learning to love myself, learning to appreciate myself, who I am. And I think I would just straight up tell that eight-year-old, don't do it. I wouldn't know how to talk. I still wouldn't know how to talk love to that eight-year-old Juliet. I still don't know because I still have that to do. Because what has happened, you know, is that um, at my, between me and my therapist, we basically draw the bricks on me wanting to die. And I'm still learning how to live. Right, right. So, you know, it, it's, I'm not in, what is this happening? I'm not in crisis mode anymore. And right. it feels great. I'm not in crisis mode anymore. I'm not like, oh my God, I want to come and I want to, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just here. Right. And I want, I want to see what life has to offer. I want to see what God is doing. And I want, if challenges come, um, I want to see what coping mechanisms I can use. So I am actually still learning to live. And that's why I always tell people, you are healing. You're never healed mm -hmm. as long as you're alive. That's right. right? That's right. Because so you heal from something else, something else will come up even bigger that and you have to. Yeah. yeah. What does a 40-year-old Julie mm -hmm. say to a 40-year-old Julie to affirm herself? What does she look in the mirror and say to herself each morning in affirming herself? You look good. You look good. You're all right. That's when I'm joking around. But when I'm serious, I have to remind myself that I am enough. I have to remind myself because it's easy to slip back. Here is the MasterCard priceless moment. There's a verse that says when you cast out demons and you leave this space empty, the demons will come seven times stronger. Right? So now that I have taken out that, 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 tendency to suicide and stuff i have to fill it with positive things or just fill it with things that are good so i have to remind myself that i am enough i have to remind myself that comparing myself to somebody is a form of idolatry right yes Ooh. i have to remind myself that comparison is a form of idolatry so so don't do it um i have to remind myself that my triggers are it's okay to avoid your triggers because you're taking care of yourself I have to remind myself that it is okay to prioritize. I have to remind myself to not, it is okay to not get into certain conversations with my family that I don't like. I have to remind myself that it's okay to not gossip with people who I usually gossip with before just so that I could get their approval that I'm a nice person being a good friend to them, right? I have to remind myself that it's okay if someone does not like the fact that I told them, no, I can't do such and such. 
I have to be okay with people not being okay with me. So, you know, all of those things, I tell myself in the morning throughout the day, it's a process. You see, like how you shower every day, you eat every day. This healing thing is something that you have to do every day. And you will eventually graduate, graduate until it becomes easier, until it becomes a habit, it becomes a part of you. And that's really what healing is. <laughs> the smile, I get the yearly smile. <laughs> Good for you. Yep. Juliet? Good for you. I am very happy for you. Thank you. I mean, I love the joy and laughter that you bring <laughs> me. But beyond that, I'm happy for Juliet Bodley. Yep. I'm really happy for you. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. And I'm looking forward to continuing to hear about you on your healing journey. Because you bring healing to so many others. You inspire healing for so many others. That's what I realized. And I'm like, God... That's not you do your thing because me can't take any way for responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> well, you carry it well. Good for you, girl. Thank you. Nicely done. <laughs> Brought to you by MasterCard and Sagicore.